Hey there, Internet. So I'm here today with a good friend of mine, Gary Yost, like toast. Hi. And he has an awesome website called 360filmmaking.com. Lots of really cool vlog posts and blog posts all about 360 filmmaking tips, tricks. And he's also shooting on this amazing camera that I believe you're like one of the only people in the world who owns this, right? I think now there's three or four of us. So, so what is this guy? Hold it up really close so people get a nice This look. is the uh, Z-Cam V1. Not the V1 Pro. This is the new V1 and it has 10 lenses, 10 cameras. And uh, the great thing about this camera is that the, the uh, interaxial or interocular distance between the lenses is only 35 millimeters which is uh, so close that uh, you can shoot really high quality stereo down to about 12 inches away with this camera. I was blown away by some of the footage I saw that you shot on this earlier with these acrobatic uh, things happening right in front of you and the 3D was amazing. I, I know immediately when I came here, I said, oh, there's no lens on the top. I didn't even realize once I put the headset on about like, you know, any of that. I was just so immersed in the environment. Um, Another really cool thing about this camera that you won't find on most 3D 360 cameras is that each of the lenses is actually going to its own card. And these cards are not micro SD cards. These are big full size, full size SD cards, which basically allows your footage not to get compressed down. It's kind of like if you have a micro, it's almost like going down a pipeline. Yeah, obviously, if you know every camera has its own storage medium, you, you, know, you get much higher bandwidth on the overall array. So it, it works out really well. I mean, the, these are HEVC files, and um, there's not a lot of obvious compression, but you know, it's we're still not at raw files yet. The 360 cameras. One really cool thing that you mentioned to me is how it has the fan at the top in order to to help with the cooling. Is it loud when it's recording? No, it's actually uh, really silent, and you can't hear it. Uh, although I really only use the uh, internal microphones as synchronization mics for the um, you know, second uh, uh, dual system audio that I record on the Zoom H6 or the um, H2M. What is the longest that you've shot with it for? Like how, how long can it go before it needs a recharge or um, a battery card swipe? Well, um, these are 64 gig cards and I can get an hour and 40 minutes. Pretty solid. Uh, this. I've never shot anything that long. Yeah. But I, you know, I'm working on this Ramdas piece now, and it's 34 minutes long. And I've got these big, you know, Ann Bauer batteries, 190s and stuff, and uh, they last four or five hours yeah. per. So. So it's only the cards, and you know, usually at that point you're gonna want to do a reset anyway to, you know, for lunch. So. Yeah, I mean, cool. the thought of having to stitch an hour and a half. I, you know, when we did the Carnival San Francisco dance parade mm -hmm. video. Um, we did shoot about 45 or 50 minutes of footage, and uh, but I didn't stitch that in 7K. I was only stitching that in um, in 6K, and so stitching 7K is just like that extra little bit of mm -hmm. overhead and time. So one thing that's really essential for shooting 360 3D videos um, is it needs to be level. Can you tell me a little bit about like what you do to level this? I know right now sure. the tripod that we're shooting on, if you look down, it is not, I didn't level it because it's 360, we're able to fix that in post. With 3D 360, it really needs to be perfect. <laughs> yeah, it makes me jealous. Oh, there's my daughter, Ruby. Ruby, you can come on in. It's totally fine. Let me get my little bubble level. Okay. Hi there, how are you? Ruby. Very nice Ruby, to meet you. Kevin. It's funny, in the last video I posted from my Magic Leap review, um, we had somebody who's in the apartment who just got done with a shower. And so if you look, they walk out <laughs> like a, a bath's out and we're all talking serious about the magic leap and stuff. It was oh, really funny. Awkward. Yeah, it was really awkward, <laughs> but hey, it's it's more humorous. I you're, think. you're dressed, aren't you? Yep. That's good. She so, just got home from high school. So this is what I use to level it. Mm -hmm. I just I have a couple of these in my bag. Oh. And every time I set up a shot, the last thing I do is um, put this on top and I use the ball head to get it so it's... It's almost like the perfect size for the camera too, you can it, see there. It is, it looks like it's made for it. Um, and it's really important, if you screw up leveling a stereo camera, you cannot fix that in post. Mm. So, um, you know, you, you, you have to pay attention. So this is always in my pocket when I'm on a shoot. Very cool. Um, let's take a look at what's underneath it, because that's one thing that I'm always super curious about. Whoa, look at all of those. 
Yeah, there's a lot of attachment points. Let's, let's talk about them. Well, these are quarter 20, 20. No, these are um, actually uh, not quarter 20. They are 5 sixteenths uh, attachment points, the so big attachment points. And I have a quarter 20 insert in the middle one. And this is the Limo Power and uh, USB and Ethernet. So what do you use the USB for? That's something that Zcam hasn't... Uh, unveiled. Unveiled yet. <laughs> yeah, so... Because uh, you do firmware updates through a card, um, not, mm. not through the USB port. Yeah. And uh, so I don't really know... And, you know, they probably use that for calibration when they're... You know, it. you know, building the machine. That's my guess, is they can get calibration data from it. You also have a microphone jack in case you want to plug that in. Have you used that? I haven't used it. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm usually using the H2N and the H6. Yeah. I wonder why they put that in there. That's just kind of silly if you ask me. But, I mean, I think this is an amazing product, but that, that throws me off a little. It might also be for testing. Um, Ethernet is also an important one in there. You can live stream through the Ethernet. And the same is true with this one. Um, I've never done it, Ooh. so, uh, you know, I'm in it for the best possible quality. My experiments are trying to get, you know, the absolute best mm -hmm. image quality out of it. I'm an image quality junkie, so uh, I've, you know, never really played but, with 4K yeah. and live streaming. It's really painful with live streaming to see a camera that you know can output really high quality just get dumbed down and the quality just shrinking on it. Yeah. Um, another downside is YouTube and Facebook haven't monetize, monetized live streaming yet in the same way. So what's the so it's like you, you get most of your views during the live stream and then after you hit the monetization button and it's like oh those people already saw it. Lower third ads. That's all I can say. <laughs> they, That's they, coming. Yeah, but but even for standard video, they don't allow you to monetize live, which is baffling to me because it's like more and more people want to create that sort of content because then they don't have to do the post. Um, let's talk about this interface. You have here all the different cards. When it turns on, it lights up with them all? Yeah, they'll all go green, uh, assuming you know the cards are good. And then there's just simple power on off and record on off. Power, um, record, and then that's for Wi-Fi, the eye? Um, uh, you know, I think that's just to get information about what your frame rate is uh -huh. and what your resolution is on the screen. You, of course, you know, you can use an app. Um, on have, the phone. Do you connect it to your phone app when you shoot with it or? I do. So, you know, in order to get the, you know, the lenses so tightly uh, collapsed like this with that mm -hmm. 35 millimeter distance, they had to make a really small camera. And the camera is so small that it generates quite a bit of heat. Yeah. So that's why it does not have an internal battery or an internal Wi-Fi router. And so I use... So um, there's no battery going into there. It's all external battery. No, the battery would probably blow up because the operating temperature of this is about 180 like degrees, goodness. 190 degrees. It gets really hot. Um, like I said, the fan isn't loud uh, and, and it's not a problem. But 100, not, that's crazy. Just yeah. to give you guys an idea, the, the Zcam K1 Pro, which does a 180, we shot with that for pretty much a full day. It got up to like 40, 50. It was like... It was, Super cool. Yeah, it was just chilling. Well, this is 10 yeah, cameras. Yeah, yeah. It's essentially like it's not 10, two. 10 4K cameras Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a really tightly uh, collapsed array. I think that's the biggest benefit of this design and this 360 3D camera yep. compared with things like the Google Jump or the E-Halo. The bigger, or, or the Obsidian or the, Obsidian. Or the Insta360. Yeah. Anytime when you start to get further and further away... It, it's sort of like you're, you're trying to emulate a human head size. And as soon as you get bigger than the human head, it's sort of like that's not going to be regular 3D because your eyes, when you're looking around like this, they're not popping out like this in different directions. That's so, right. so that's essentially the, the simplest way I can explain why this design makes the most sense. Well, it, it allows you to create a very, very large data set from which the stitching algorithm can choose you know, points to create the left and the right eye views. You want to create as rich a data set as possible because face it, the stitching algorithm is kind of magic. It's not like with VR 180 where you have a left and a right eye. You're, you're interpolating the left and right eye in a 360 degree sphere, which is bizarre math. How does it do with low lighting? It's not the greatest low light camera in the world because it's a small mm -hmm. sensor, you know. Yeah. It's not like the V1 Pro. That's the big advantage the V1 Pro has over the V1. It has mm -hmm. that micro four third sensor. So, um, you know, it's absolutely not a low light beast. 
you want to feed it a fair amount of light. I mean, you'll see uh, blocking, you know, compression blocking mm -hmm. in the shadows if you don't get enough light. It seems like from what I saw in the headset, though, this is probably the best 3D 360 camera on the market right now next to the Pro. Um, yeah, it, it actually has benefits over the Pro if you have enough light mm -hmm. because of this really tight interocular distance. Um, uh, it produces, uh, I think, slightly better because I had a Pro for a little while yeah. that I borrowed from Nick and um, uh, I did some tests and it's slightly better in terms of stereo than the Pro, but it, it definitely can't hold a candle to the Pro's low light. Well, I, I mean, at the end of the day, with lights, my theory and thinking is you could always add more light to a location or scene unless you're filming, like, a, you know, the stars in the sky. Sure. Um, so that's always something I'm like, okay, whatever. But what I think most about is how close you can get with 3D. Because having come from 360, you know, filming, you can get super close to the camera. I love filming these dog and cat option videos where the camera yeah, I saw that so, on so close. And with 3D, it's always been one of these things. So what is the closest distance that you can get to this? Well, you, you know, I, I've, I've posted a few uh, tests in the Zcam forum, but um, you can get about 12 inches away. That said, you know, when you get close to these cameras, the, you know, the person gets really huge. Yeah. And it, it's not totally comfortable to have mm -hmm. someone's face just that gigantic up, right yeah. in your face. So you can get 12 inches away. But the bigger issue, I think with this camera and this really great data set it produces is that the stereo is really uh, comfortable. It's mm -hmm. very comfortable and yeah. it feels good in the headset. Like when you watch that acrobatic piece, it felt really natural, didn't mm -hmm. it? Even when the people walked past me, I never felt like I was getting that sort of, you know, that... Mm -hmm. uh... That weird zigy mm -hmm. thing. And that's what the 10 cameras give you. Um, and so, you know, at this point in September of 2018, you know, this is absolutely the best stereoscopic 360 camera uh, that's off the shelf. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Are, are you excited about any other cameras in, coming out in the near future? I don't, you know, I, I mean, I've seen like the day two and all. I've seen what everybody mm -hmm. sees on Mike's blog, you know. Yeah. It's great to see all that stuff. But nothing really looks like they're trying to solve the problem in... Um, really as physically correct a way as what the Zcam team has done. So, you know, these cameras are bigger and the, you know, the lenses mm -hmm. are farther apart. Uh, I think that the engineering challenge in this camera was so great that it's going to be a while before somebody else comes out with uh, a radial array of so many cameras that are packed into this tight of space. Yeah, I, I kind of have to agree with you, although I am excited about what Google's doing with the holograms, although, you know, getting one of those things set up in your place, and, you know, scanning the giant things. Is, is that shipping you, next month? Yeah, no, those things are not <laughs> shipping at all. Oh, <laughs> 25 GoPros attached to it. But that being said, it certainly um, makes me think about the future of this tech and, you know, will this eventually get to a point where I have 10 cameras like this and I can fit it in my pocket? And yeah, take it out and have I don't know. I mean, a protest in there's 3D physics issues with lenses. There's heat issues. You know, there's just a lot of physics going on that make it hard to do this stuff correctly. Um, what I'd like to see is this kind of a form factor with a larger sensor. Mm. You know, I would like you know just more dynamic range. I'd like to see you know even you know higher bandwidth uh, and. Um, a less compressed 10-bit image would be my dream because I'm a DaVinci Resolve colorist as well yeah. and my dream is to be able to work with these images the way I work with 10-bit or 12-bit images. Mm -hmm. So a 10-bit version of this camera would be currently my dream camera. Nice. So I, I also want to bring up, um, I, I googled you and came across your Wikipedia page. Mm. I noticed all these, these references to um, CAD software. Mm. Can you tell me about this and your background in this? Yeah, in a prior life, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I was, um, let's see, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And then in my early 20s, uh, I bought a little Timex Sinclair computer and I started to play around making things, you know, move on the screen, little kind of ASCII mm -hmm. art moving around on the screen. I thought, oh, this is interesting, kind of another way of making films. And um, it was much less expensive to play around with these little microcomputers uh, mm -hmm. that were just appearing in the mid-80s than it was 
to try to get a career in Hollywood. Going. Oh yeah, because you got to print all the film. It's expensive. You so know. I, you know, it, I I felt like okay, maybe I can do something with these microcomputers, and I ended up uh, making a bunch of uh, 3D software uh, to do animation on the Atari oh. ST, the 68,000 Motorola processor thing back in. 1986 and 1987 and then I got a couple friends together and we uh, signed a contract with Autodesk in 1988 and we uh, we eventually came out with you know what we were thinking of as the AutoCAD of 3D animation in 1990 this thing called Autodesk 3D Studio and then it kind of evolved kind of we were all put on the treadmill of you know upgrading the software mm -hmm. for a big publicly held company and we we ended up selling Autodesk 3ds Max to Autodesk in 1997, and by 99, we were out of all that. And I still think 3ds Max is the widest selling, most popular 3D content creation system. But my goal was always really just to be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And um, after we sold it, um, I started getting into digital photography, which was a brand new mm -hmm. thing. And as soon as I could uh, uh, get a camera that produced moving images. I got into that and I kind of reinvented myself as a filmmaker. So nice. um, I have been in this 3D world since 1986, which I think is 32 years. So um, so this really, um, it, it brings together a lot of the creativity uh, applications that I was looking for uh, synthetically through computers, but now I can do it with real imagery. So um, I'm, I'm pretty much doing the same kind of thing that I always wanted to do. Back when um, I was a teenager, me and my buddies used to sit around and have these pipe dreams mm -hmm. of you know, having a film studio in our bedrooms, essentially. Yeah. And this goes back to the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now um, I think we, you know, we've really accomplished that dream. So effectively now I'm doing the same thing I used to dream about in high school. Uh, we used to call it Surreally Studios, and you'd be able to do motion pictures and sound and you know, music production all on a little machine that you'd have in your room. Yeah, it's incredible how the technology has just gotten so much smaller and more affordable. I, I call it the rising tide of technology. Whenever these things sort of like a new one comes out, the price on everything else drops. Right. Um, right. I can't wait for a future when this sort of thing is like, you know, a hundred bucks. You know, oh, like yeah. A, well, that's the uh, next yeah. thing. Of course, it's $9,000 now. It'd yeah. be nice if it was $900. Uh, but I, you know, I think these are pretty bespoke. I don't think they make a ton of these. No. I think they kind of almost probably make them to order. You know, that's yeah. They have the parts on the shelf and they, uh, and they can just put them together as they need them. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone's forget. noticed this piece of pink tape that you gave me, this little roll here. So this, uh, this weekend, actually in three days, I'm going to be shooting a concert on stage up at the top of Mount Tamalpais for the Sound Summit. And this band is uh, Cone Brio, an eight-piece funk band with a, a front man who does uh, backflips and splits and all sorts of acrobatics on stage. And uh, Kevin asked me, like, how am I going to make sure he doesn't hit the camera, this yeah. $9,000 camera, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, I, you know, I just got to put it somewhere where it's safe. And he said, you should put some brightly colored neon tape on the monopod. Yeah. So he can see it really clearly because yeah. obviously the camera's not going to see it. I'm going to do yeah. removal anyway. And uh, I didn't have any neon tape. So thank you very much. Of course. Yeah, no problem. To, yeah. yeah, I, I really appreciate it. This could save my camera. It, it really could weekend. save you $9,000. This little, <laughs> little trick right there. I want to thank you again for doing the interview with me. Thank you, Find Kevin. out more um, 360filmmaking.com. I'm going to put a link in the description below this video. And, and definitely check out his stuff because there's tons of things on there and uh, great knowledge base. Um, and you, go be creative. Yeah, be creative. Hit that like button, subscribe, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace.